Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Mega Projects. I, as always, am your host, Simon, and this one, it's, uh, well, planes often heavily requested, like the experimental, the more interesting, all of those, you know, military aircraft heavily requested here, and this, of course, is the XB-70, so let's jump in. Imagine Concord equipped with a devastating nuclear arsenal. Extremely badass. A plane combining supersonic speed with terrifying, apocalyptic firepower. This fearsome notion, well, it nearly became a reality with the American XB-70, commonly known as Valkyrie. Somewhat ironically, or perhaps not, in fact, Valkyrie is a name taken from Norse mythology. Female figures who chose who lived and died in battle. Those selected were taken to Valhalla, the Hall of the Slain, where they spent their days feasting on wild boar and preparing for Ragnarok, the cataclysm cataclysmic final showdown of the Norse gods. Had the XB-70 developed into what was originally planned, it too would have held the power of life over death, but on something of a more astronomical scale. There are plenty of ifs and buts in this story of what was nearly the world's first supersonic nuclear bomber, and which first appeared nearly a decade before Concorde. The tale of the XB-70 Valkyrie is one of groundbreaking engineering, bad timing, and of course, plenty of Cold War posturing, because Cold War posturing always makes for a good mega project. During the 1950s, some very ominous planning was taking place in both the United States and the USSR, with both sides developing strategies in the event of a nuclear war. Essentially, how can we destroy them without being destroyed first? Nuclear weapons had, of course, arrived on the scene at the end of World War II, with the devastation that had befallen Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. But while the Americans may have afforded themselves a degree of breathing room, knowing they were the only nation with the atomic bomb, well, it didn't last very long. Just four years later, in 1949, the Soviets detonated their first nuclear weapon. In the coming decades, as you probably know, the nuclear arms race got completely out of control and the world began hurtling down a dark peak to 1986 when there was an estimated 70,300 nuclear weapons scattered all throughout the world. The overwhelming majority of these were divided between the United States and the USSR, with both nations exploring various methods of nuclear deployment. Nuclear submarines were of course introduced, and eventually so were intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. These were capable of striking a target thousands of miles away. It's all pretty terrifying stuff. But while ICBMs had appeared in the United States in 1959, they were still considered somewhat experimental. A planned nuclear strike carried out by the United States would still most most likely be done in the same way the very first attack had come from an aircraft. But things had changed pretty drastically since 1945. Striking the USSR would need an aircraft that could tick multiple boxes. It had to be capable of carrying a nuclear weapon weighing several tons. It had to carry enough fuel to make it to the USSR. And perhaps most difficult of all, it would need to be fast enough to escape the blast radius. Perhaps even supersonic fast. But it wasn't just carrying a nuclear weapon that was being discussed. As early as the 1940s, the idea of an aircraft powered by nuclear energy had been on the table. The nuclear reactor on board an aircraft could keep it powered for months rather than hours. I mean, why you'd want an aircraft to remain in the air for months at a time is another matter, but importantly, it was feasible. Like I said, the Cold War, loads of cool shit came out of it. And by the way, there is, I think it was a design by Lockheed for this giant nuclear plane plane that is an absolutely incredible thing. I'm not sure if it's long enough for a mega project, but if you'd like me to do nuclear planes, this absolutely giant nuclear plane aircraft carrier sort of thing, let me know in the comments below. In 1955, the US Air Force set out General Operational Requirement Number 38. The brief called for a combination of two aspects from aircrafts that were already in operation. The payload and the intercontinental range of the B-52 with the Mach 2 top speed of the Convair B-58 Hustler. It's like, guys, yeah, we want something as big as the B-52, you know, that giant propeller-driven plane, except we want it to go twice the speed of sound, okay? <laughs> 
Chill out, guys. There would be two separate aircraft designs explored, one nuclear, codenamed Weapon System 125A, and one conventional, codenamed Weapon System 110A. In July 1955, six contractors were selected to bid on the projects, with Boeing and North American Aviation being awarded contracts for Phase 1 development on the 8th of November 1955. In mid-1956, both companies presented their designs, which came out remarkably similar, and were both rejected by the Air Force for being too too large. Each had a takeoff weight of approximately 340 tons with large fuel loads. Phase 1 development ended, but both contractors were encouraged to continue their design studies. It was also around this time that the US Air Force concluded that a nuclear powered nuclear bomber was not only unfeasible, but, you know, incredibly dangerous, and not just for the enemy. It's not entirely clear when this portion of the project was completely scrapped, but some claim it continued until 1961 before being terminated at a final cost rumored to be over a billion dollars in today's money. Quick side note here before we move on, the US did put a nuclear reactor on an aircraft in the 1950s, however, it had nothing to do with the XB-70. The Convair NB-36H remains to this day the only US aircraft to fly using a nuclear reactor between the 17th of September 1955 and March 1957. It incorporated a huge lead shield to protect the crew from contamination, and while it was a success in this aspect, the risk of what might happen in the event of an accident led to it being cancelled in 1961. In case you're wondering, of course, yes, the Soviets had one too. It was the Tupolev 119, which apparently flew 40 times from 19 1961 to 1969. Again, if you'd like a video about these, let me know below. I can't promise it because some of these experimental aircraft that don't get made, it's like there's no way I'm filling a 15 minute video with it, but uh, let me know in the comments if you really want it and I'll see what I can do. The Soviets didn't have quite the same approach to safety, and a pilot who was part of this program had stated that the majority of the crew died as a result of radiation poisoning. That got dark quickly. <laughs> it's a nuclear powered aircraft. Why not put a giant lead shield in it? You're not burning any extra fuel. I mean, there's an almost unlimited amount of fuel. One factor that seems to have been taken as a given in early development was known as the DASH concept. It stated that the aircraft would only need to activate at supersonic speed once the payload had been released. But developments in supersonic technology had led to some debate over whether this was actually the best method. It was found that when an engine was optimized for supersonic speed, the most economical cruise speed in terms of fuel per mile was actually at its top speed. While the engine consumed less fuel flying at a lower speed, of course, it would take around four times longer to cover the same distance. If an aircraft could reach Mach 3, its most economical flying pattern was to remain at this speed for the majority of the flight. Both North American Aviation and Boeing began redesigning their aircraft to fly continuously at Mach 3, and each came back with a new design with long fuselages and large delta wings. Delta wings are those, you know, like in the shape of a triangle, like you see on the Concorde. The main difference between the two was the engine layouts. North American had six engines in a semicircular duct under the rear fuselage, while Boeing had separate podded engines on pylons below the wings. On August 30, 1957, the Air Force deemed both designs satisfactory and competition between the two was initiated, with requirements for a cruising speed of Mach 3.0 to 3.2, an over-target altitude of 21 to 23,000 meters, a range of up to 16,900 kilometers, and a gross weight not to exceed 220 tons. On December 23, 1957, the North American proposal was declared the winner, and a month later, a contract was issued. In February 1958, the bomber was designated the B-70, with an X added to signify that it was an experimental aircraft. Another contest was held to give it a real name, and of the 20,000 entries received, Valkyrie was chosen. The Air Force approved a 18-month program acceleration in March 1958, which scheduled the first flight for December 1961, and in early 1960, a drawing of the XB-70 was released to the public by North American. While the Americans may have been forgiven for thinking that everything was running smoothly, they certainly wouldn't have it all their own way. Developments in service-to-air missiles in the Soviet Union would cause a serious headache even before the XB-70 had been completed. The XB-70 was, of course, designed to fly very high, and very fast. Two factors that made it virtually impossible for interceptor jets to provide air cover. But the 1950s had seen a dramatic improvement in surface-to-air missiles, and with the downing of a U-2 spy plane over the Soviet Union in 1962, the Americans suddenly realized this height and speed 
would not make them invincible. For the first time, there was a real discussion over the benefits of low-altitude bombing runs over high altitude. It was found that the SA-2 missile, which had downed the U-2, had a minimum altitude of roughly 610 meters, which is about 2,000 feet. Below this, it was technically flying unguided before the radar system began to track it and then guide it towards the enemy aircraft. In theory, staying below this altitude meant that the bombers could not be tracked by the missiles. Then there was the radar systems themselves. Flying close to the ground often means radar struggles to pick up an aircraft, essentially hiding it among the terrain. What's more, the benefits the XB-70 had at high altitude were almost completely negated when flying at low altitude, where it could only operate at Mach 0.9. The introduction of the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile in 1959 and its subsequent upgrades proved to be another damaging blow for an aircraft that was still battling its way through development. The US Air Force was faced with an uncomfortable dilemma – continue with the wildly expensive program that may produce an obsolete aircraft, or bite the bullet and call it a day. In December 1959, the Air Force made the announcement that the XB-70 project would be cut and designated as prototypes, with most of its subsystems being scrapped. President Eisenhower had a particularly withering assessment of the aircraft, saying that he thought we were talking about bows and arrows at a time of gunpowder when we spoke of bombers in the missile age. During the upcoming U.S. election, the XB-70 issue became politicized. John F. Kennedy, eager to paint the Republicans as weak on defense, wholeheartedly backed the project, and in November 1960, the XB-70 program received $265 million, about $2.3 billion today, from Congress for the following fiscal year. But everything changed entirely once JFK was elected. The story goes that he was told the missile gap theory, which claims that high-altitude bombers could operate at a height that made them impervious to missiles, was in fact, just a complete illusion. By this stage, $800 million, about $6.8 billion today, had been spent on the B-70. But that didn't stop the new president from scrapping the program, labeling it unjustifiable. Instead, he directed the prototype, which was nearing completion, to be used as an experimental aircraft to explore the further feasibility of supersonic travel. This led to some rather unsavory back and forths in Congress, where it became clear that some members were pushing for the XB-70 because their districts had factories linked with the construction, not because it was a worthwhile project. But eventually, the decision stood. The Valkyrie's path to being a high-altitude bomber was now very much blocked. In March 1961, the US Air Force reduced the production order to three prototypes, which was later again reduced to two. Air Vehicle 1, AV-1, and Air Vehicle 2, AV-2. AV-1 was completed on the 7th of May 1964, with its maiden flight taking place in September. AV-2 was completed a month later, on the 15th of October 1964. It's a little sad that this aircraft was never really put to full use, because it really was a remarkable piece of engineering. The aircraft was primarily constructed using stainless steel and titanium set out in a canard design, meaning two small forewings that were placed further forward than the main delta wings. The outer portions of the main wings were hinged and could be pivoted downward up to 65 degrees, greatly improving the aircraft's directional stability at supersonic speeds. The XB-70 was equipped with six General Electric YJ-93 GE-3 turbines turbojet engines, creatively named, each producing 28,000 pound force with an afterburner, an increased thrust to add extra speed, and 19,900 without. The afterburner force was around 10,000 pound force less than Concorde, and considerably less than what bombers use today. Like many supersonic aircraft, the XB-70's nose needed to be positioned in such a way that pilots could not see the ground during landing or takeoff. To compensate for this, the XB-70 used a streamlined visor that could move down the aircraft's nose and provide the pilots with a view of the ground. The aircraft measured 50 56.39 meters and had a total wingspan of 32 meters, which isn't particularly large in either aspect. It had an empty takeoff weight of roughly 115 tons. That's about the same as a blue whale, but it had an absolutely mammoth service ceiling of 23,580 meters, over twice the cruising altitude of a standard passenger airliner. And if you care for an interesting visual, that's 53 Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other. The XB-70 only had an operational life of four years, first taking to the sky on the 21st of September 1964 and completing its final flight on the 4th of February 1969, which was to the museum in Dayton, Ohio, that 
AV-1 still sits in to this very day. Its first flight between Palmdale and Edwards Air Force Base was actually almost a disaster. One engine had to be shut down shortly after takeoff, while an undercarriage problem meant that it remained in the down position for the entire flight, limiting its speed to 627 kilometers an hour, half of what had been planned. During landing, several of its wheels locked, rupturing the tires and causing a small fire. It's fair to say that it was a bit of a rocky start. But things they did improve quickly. AV-1 went supersonic on its third test flight on October 12, 1964, and surpassed Mach 3, that's 3,704 kilometers an hour, or 2,301 miles an hour, on the 14th of October 1965, reaching a final speed of Mach 3.02. AV-2 took to the skies for the first time on the 17th of July 1965, but had a short life that would come to an abrupt end in tragic circumstances on the 8th of June 1966. At the request of General Electric, AV-2, along with an F-4 Phantom, an F-5, and a T-38 Talon, and an F-104 Starfighter, were flying in close formation for a photo shoot. Shortly after the picture had been taken, the F-104, whose pilot may have struggled to gauge the distance from the Valkyrie, drifted into the XB-70's wing before rolling over and exploding, destroying the Valkyrie's rudders and damaging its left wing. AV-2 went into an uncontrolled spin and crashed near Barstow in California. While the XB-70's pilot was able to eject, its co-pilot and the pilot of the F-104 died in the accident. And with that tale of high-altitude tragedy, we come to the end of the story of the XB-70 Valkyrie, an aircraft that was envisioned with such high hopes and aspirations, and yet one that came to a slightly flat end. The Valkyries never did have to choose between who lived and who died. So how do we remember these supersonic phantoms which disappeared before we even really knew they were there? It's easy to view the program as a failure. But the truth is the XB-70 fulfilled all of the requirements set out by the US Air Force in 1957. In terms of range, service ceiling, speed, and bomb capacity, it was a great success. The accident in 1966 didn't help, but the cause had very little, if anything, to do with the Valkyrie. The XB-70's downfall was that the world was fundamentally changing, even as it was in development. This says more about the extraordinary speed of the development of military technology during the 1950s and 1960s than it does of a failed aircraft. The power to choose between life and death was more prevalent than ever, but it was now a power that lay elsewhere in other hands. So I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Mega Projects. I made what feels like several suggestions in this video for future videos. If you like those ideas, please do go down in the comments and let me know. Thumbs up the one you like. Also, if you thumbs up this video, that would be great. Obviously, if you didn't like it, you can use the thumbs down. That's what it's for. But you're here at the end of the video. So like I say, unless you hate watch the whole thing, smash that like button. And as always, thank you for watching. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. That too.